Right then, and here we go again. More schema changes and updates for everyone. Um, anyone that's listening, just let us know where you're from. I see we've got every vegan recipe from the USA watching. Um, everyone else, let us know where you're from. Let, we'll give it a couple of minutes for everyone to jump in. And um, we'll get into these recent updates that have been pushed out from schema.org. So we've got we um, Persia and, and Mongolia. Nice. That's Very it. interesting. That's it. Yeah, Mongolia. That's good. That's a good one. Right then. So I think we've got a few people. Yeah, we've got a few people in here now. So let's get cracking. Um, yeah, obviously, it's my pleasure to be hosting this with two great structured data minds, uh, Martha and Jono. Um, they will do a much better job of introducing themselves than me. So I'll let Martha kick off. Sure. My name is Martha Van Brickel. I'm coming to you live from Canada. It's snowy and cold here today. Um, and I am the CEO at Schema App. We do schema markup every day, all day. And we have tools that work with any and every website. So happy to, to share sort of what's new and coming down the pipe and uh, banter with my friend Jono. Amazing. I've just updated my name to... Oh, my God. You're so good to work. I love it. Full note yeah. points. We just had somebody who said hello from Hawaii. Like, I'm here in the UK, yeah. and it is cold, so swap places. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Jono. Um, I work for a company called Yoast, which if you've done anything in the world of WordPress, um, you've probably heard of. We're best known for our SEO plugin. Um, a big part of my day job is thinking about schema and this level of nerdiness so that you don't have to. Um, I want to help you all live in a world where all this is automated and magical, um, but in the meantime, it's still fascinating to nerd out about. So hopefully we have some fun stuff to um, to explore today. I'm going to take my schema out my name because that is unreal. <laughs> that's that's it. That's super. And anyone that's watching, if you've got any questions, just drop them in the chat there and we'll get to those after these guys have started sharing their insights into what's up and coming, new and pending. So over to you, Martha. Sure. So um, I'm going to kick us off by by just sharing a little bit about like what's changing and and what's new, and then uh, John is going to dig a little deeper into into pending, which is which is great. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Martha, um, as I said, and I always like to share my knowledge graph. And one of these days, I'm going to mix it up. Actually, I have one with my kids on it since I spent a lot of time with them this summer. Um, but I, I I did grow up at Cisco and Enterprise. Those of you joining from California, I lived there for a bunch of years, um, and I I do have a technical background, so I, I don't get to do a lot of technical stuff these days, um, but I do have a degree in, in mathematics and engineering. I um, actually spent some time in the UK, Jono, up in uh, up in Glasgow, and I am one of the founders of Schema App. So I've been doing Schema Markup for a long time. Before any of you cared about Schema Markup, um, we were doing Schema Markup, uh, building tools and sort of adopting it from a, a semantic technology background. I am Canadian, and I, um, I used to own a 1965 Austin Healey Sprite that actually starred in a movie directed by Kevin Bacon, and Kevin Kevin Bacon used to drive my car. And I always share it this way because I'm using schema markup here to define these relationships. And then you've now inferred you can win the six degrees from Kevin Bacon game. And, and so this is, again, the same way you can use schema markup. And we've talked about connected schema markup and, and lots of other pieces. But what we're going to talk about today is, is sort of what's been changing. And, you know, it's it's been an interesting year for all of us. But I, I think what's really exciting is, is we're seeing continued acceleration of Google's investment in schema markup and how they're using it to, I'll say like capture some of the trends that's, that are going on as a result of coronavirus. And so um, I'm going to go through like some of the new things that have been coming out in the last um, 60 to, to, to 90 days. Um, but I want to kind of also connect the dots that these tie very clearly to, you know, again, you know, trends of consumer buying behavior and, and what's going on in the world. But the first one I want to call out is, is image license. So this moved out of beta. So it was in beta. Funny story uh, with the image licensing for beta. Google actually called us the day that this went into beta. And uh, what was super fun is they were calling to make sure Schema App was ready to support it, which we were. And, and so it was just a, you know, Google called. Love, love that story. Um, and, and so this is where images can use the schema.org property to call out the license um, for that. And you can see in the image over here on the right, you know, it like kind of pops up with licensable and then details about the license. What I love about this is that, you know, the license property has existed forever within schema.org. So if you think about sort of like they were planning on this back in 2011 when they wrote the vocabulary. And so my always question goes to like the big push of GDPR and other things around how people are reusing content. This is now looking, being used in image area, but you know, where might that also play a 
role sort of down the pipe. You know, you think of FAQ, Jono, right? When like people are like, that's my content. Google's now showing it and getting the eyes on it. You know, I, I, I wonder if this is not just a first step in, in sort of a foray into this space. Absolutely. And you look at the continuing um, hardening of privacy and ownership rules and consent models, there's definitely a direction of travel towards stricter definitions on what's public, what's private, how things can be used, what requires permission. There's so much happening in this space. Yeah, starting to define different types of licensing and that level of details is definitely going to be where this goes next. Yeah, so we'll, we'll kind of see where that plays. The next um, new rich result that came out was around home activities. Now, for those of you that are working from home and have children, so my kids are five and seven, full of energy, needing entertainment. You know, this seems like a really logical rich result for them to bring out. It's sort of like this should be like tagged like COVID rich result. Um, so it's really where home fitness and well-being um, is the example here, but it's any home activities. It's primarily on video. This one's only allowed in English in the US on mobile devices, so it's it's still quite restricted. But again, sort of really meeting a, a, a need right now around sort of like how do we sort of come up with you know fitness and wellness, like other activities that people can do home and bring that directly to the searcher that's going on. And and I think this is like it's almost like an extension of a niche area of video um, and how like that the video carousel is showing up. So I expect this one to expand over time, um, not just across English and US, but a, across like many many different types of searches. I was really um, intrigued with this one to see, there was a little footnote somewhere in their release notes which said, um, oh, and by the way, this can also apply to historical events, mm. um, which I, I assume there's a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of websites out there that have this kind of content, but buried away in archives. And it was really nice for them to explicitly say, actually, it's perfectly fine to go and describe uh, an online yoga class that you filmed in 2006, if it's still relevant. So hopefully people can resurface some of that archive material. Well, and even events like now that all evolved right, where it can be a virtual event, whereas before Google was really, really hardened with it having a location and, and sort of restricting, you know, so, you know, I could do probably a whole talk on like how rich results have evolved as a result of the global pandemic. But I see it kind of broader and just like the overall trends, which kind of leads me um, to the last new rich result that we've seen come out, which is around shipping details. I don't know about you, but like Paul was just talking about how he finally got something that he ordered from Google back in August or <laughs> September, Paul, was it? Um, yeah, August last year, actually, it was. <laughs> and, and, and I know, like, I always love, I was looking for something this week, and I realized that, like, the cost of shipping was going to be, like, a third of the cost of the thing that I was buying. I was like, no, nah, not so sure. You should buy it from there. So, but this is, you know, where that shipping cost can show up in the search result. Again, this one us english mobile devices to begin but i love this for e-commerce because you know it is something that sort of helps you with intent it's something that you want to know right at the beginning of your journey are you going to actually jump in it's a great way to stand out and a, something else to diversify if you don't have price or ratings um, that you can get this sort of free shipping rich results shown out there so these are sort of i'll say like the big moves that we've seen sort of at, over the last piece around rich results um, but it's also been some really fun areas around um, releases so so, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll call out one that I really loved and, and where, again, we're seeing um, Google be more, um, I'll say, like, verbal. And, you know, I, I think you may call this out in yours, Jono, where, like, we're seeing Google being like, this is a proposal from Google. Is it really a proposal or is Google saying what they need to schema.org? <laughs> so um, this was part of schema.org 11 or 10 release that came out in September. September was the ninth release of schema.org in 2020, the most we've ever had. And just yesterday, or two days ago, but it only actually got published on the web, um, version 11. So very timely as we talk about new things. Uh, so schema.org version 11 was was just released. Um, you know, what's interesting about this, and, and so apt for what we prepared to share with you today, is, you know, there's there's a big focus on pending here. And, and John is going to kind of dig into pending. Now, with sort of my call out that in schema.org, Tim, there was this um, sort of properties around energy efficiency that that Google had suggested. So Alex Jansen, who's um, talking here in GitHub, uh, GitHub's where schema.org kind of discussions happen. Um, you know, he was sort of calling out the need to kind of call out specific properties around energy efficiency. We see a, a continued focus in the version 11 release around products. So there's uh, two specific uh, pending properties that I'll call out. 
One is around the identification of price categories. So draw your eyes here around invoice, list price, sale front price, um, manufacturing sales price, advertised price, price by standard weight volume. So really helping be very, very, very clear about sort of the type of price that it is. And um, as Schema App, we've been using all kinds of undocumented <laughs> schema.org properties um, to, to manage this over the years. And it's really actually great that this delineation, again, it's impending, which means it's not sort of fully published, but shows intent as to where they want to go. Um, what also, if you've not looked at GitHub, I know we're going to talk a little bit about different players. Uh, Alex Jansen, Google Shopping, Dan Brickley's kind of schema.org leader. Um, we're going to, and then Martin Hepp, who's also like a great semantic ontologist. Um, and then the second one that came out um, in the release, just published again on the 30th of November this year, is another one from Google Shopping. Interesting. Um, <laughs> and this sort of talks about like the different price types with installments and subscriptions. Um, and so you can see they use an example here like phone and data service, but like what's the down payment or the one-time payment, the monthly installments or a subscription plan. So a lot of work coming from Google Shopping with regards to delineating the difference between types of price. Um, but you know, there's in, in, in release 11, again, most of the changes here, um, see they fixed a typo, big whoopee. Um, the other big change <laughs> they did make was like in the actual schema or documentation, they've changed the tree to actually be like easier to navigate. Um, so lots going on around like clarity, um, which has been a lot of the Google changes over the last couple months is them trying to add clarity on what they're trying to do. But if there was any doubt, if schema markup was some sort of, I'll say like core to their strategy to understanding and sort of evolving, um, you know, here I've, I've highlighted some e-commerce, there's different areas around events. Um, there's also call out specifically around articles. Um, do not fear, I think it's here to stay. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Jono, because he's going to dig a lot more into pending. And, and I think this is, you know, again, very, very apt based on the fact that uh, version 11 has a ton of pending. So Jono, over to you. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Um, I've just frantically put in another slide into my deck because you triggered something. <laughs> good that stuff, remembered. good but, stuff. Um, go, go, go. I had some thoughts on your stuff before we dived in as well, which might yeah, be yeah. interesting. Um, what was I thinking? So the the movement into lots of delineated bits of different prices to me is hugely exciting because it suggests um, that schema is more and more a first class citizen of the web, right? So at the moment, if you have an e-commerce store, you have a whole bunch of middleware that generates XML feeds and sends them from your sales force to Google Merchant Center and it's clunky and it's expensive and it doesn't operate in real time increasingly where we're moving to is Google are giving us the tools to Google are giving us schema is describing and Google are now incentivizing adoption um, so that we can make our websites the way we describe the truth. And this is something we've talked about, the idea that our websites are now the way we communicate the data of our business, not just marketing tools. I think that's astounding. Yeah, right? well, I think, you know, the, the thing that people miss and, you know, like, Again, we, we use the whole vocabulary at Schema App, right? Like there's this like very large, robust, you know, vocabulary. And, and we're maybe like the, the the opposite of Yoast where you're trying to really, you know, do that auto magic, right? Make it happen yeah. for like the most common scenarios. And then we're sort of at the other spectrum to say, you know, your website's unique. You might be trying to, you know, maybe you're a big mobile provider that needs to talk about subscriptions and different pieces. Like we're sort of that, you know, scalpel that allows you to use like all the extensions and all the different aspects of it. But the fact is, is that like your content is unique, right? It's about you and you're trying to explain, you know, I'll say with clarity to make sure that you have the understanding so that you can connect with the people who also care about those things. And so I think that's like, that's the power of like, we're seeing continued investment in it, but also know that like, there's a lot of stuff in schema.org today that you can use to better clarify, um, you know, who you are and what you do. And it's just really a matter of like getting into it and then finding to make sure you have the right tools, depending on your business. Again, we use Yo stuff for, for our blog because it does a great job, right? Um, so it really depends on what, you know, what do you need a scalpel for to be really explicit? Nice. Very nice. I also realized there's two bits that we haven't talked about, which we should uh, mention on the back of your product stuff. Um, I know there's a whole bunch of conversations happening on GitHub around um, curbside pickup and kind of mm. defining types of delivery, which is very COVID-y new world. 
but getting those exposed in the search results in Google totally. Shopping. Totally. This is delivery, this is curbside, this is available within an hour. Those sorts of things are really cool. Yeah, I was just, uh, someone was just asking me about like talking about trends. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many things that we've seen sort of evolve as a result of, uh, and I'll call it consumer behavior, right? Like it's mm. like the pandemic has accelerated, you know, the fact that my mother can now call Amazon or like knows how to order her groceries online and go do curbside pickup and so forth, right? So I feel like it's, it's sort of accelerated some behavior changes is that those of us who kind of grew up in the internet generation just like take, you know, it's like, of course we can do that. Like, what do you mean you can't order on Amazon on your phone and know when it's delivered and be notified sort of when it's sitting at my front door, right? So um, so to me, that's that's the exciting part is that, you know, we're seeing that accelerated evolution. Um, I think hence by evidence of also like seeing 10 releases of a schema.org in one year, like it's unheard of. <laughs> yeah, isn't it just? Yeah, they've been nice, well, definitely. Um, to your point, this is the slide I just frantically put in, to your point on how much Google are focusing on this and how much stuff is going on. This is a screenshot um, of Google's developer updates page. So every time Google launch a new feature or create change something which they think should be relevant to the developer world, they put a little change log in. I've color coded it. All of the blue ones are to do with schema.org and structured data, whether it's their documentation or tools or support. This is 80% of the updates that Google has mentioned are relevant to developers since like April are schema related. I love this. Yeah, that's I how big a deal it is. It's awesome. Anyway, I'll tweet right. that out, though, if people don't know where to find that. They, uh, oh, nice, they yeah. find it. I did have a link in it, but I butchered the slide in my haste to get in in time. So, um, yeah, Martha mentioned, let's talk about pending. So all the all the immediate rich results stuff you want to get from Google today is in the core of schema.org, but that's only today. Tomorrow's stuff is all in pending.schema, and that is a mix of stuff which isn't quite supported and out yet and stuff that's quite early on its journey that might change and evolve and mature as different people use it or as it turns out nobody uses it or if people use it wrong and it's confusing they might revisit it it's a playground and a beta area and a kind of melting pot for what's coming next and it's the first place we really get a solid idea of okay what is this thing where is it going and there are some really interesting things in here um, you can get to this at pending.schema.org and have a look around it looks and works the same as the main schema site um, except it's full of all sorts of interesting examples of stuff, which I'm going to pick out a small handful of to give you an idea of what's there. We can talk around them and see where we're going. Um, from an SEO perspective, this abstract, weird concept is one of the ones that gets me most excited. Um, this has been in Schema for a while, this idea of defined term, um, that if I have a a thing I want to describe, think about a glossary. A glossary is a set of defined terms. A cat is a type of animal with fur that meows, etc. That is a defined term. And you can describe defined terms in schema.org today. This is pretty straightforward. It's a pretty, pretty simple standard. What's interesting about this is when you can um, combine it with indefined term set, I can now say explicitly, this is a glossary. This is a set of definitions, not just uh, a cat is an animal, but this is a set of descriptors of different type of animals and their properties. I can start, animals are not the best example for this, but I'll come on to a better one. You can start to describe the relationships between the things you're describing and each other, which can get pretty powerful. Why? Because there was a recent change which um, allowed us to start using defined terms on keyword properties. Now, the keyword property has been a bit of a weird orphan thing in schema.org for a while. You can, and that's kind of supposed to use it to mention um, what your articles and your pages and your things are about. But it's used really um, differently by different people in different ways. It's a pretty loose standard. Um, some people put tags in there. Some people put meta keyword style content in there. It's a bit all over the place. There was a Google, con Google initiated conversation about tightening up this scope and definition. So now I can explicitly use it to describe what things my content is about in a way that I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Let me give you an example. And here's the conversation for reference between um, some faces we'll come on to in a minute. If I have a blog post, which is, for example, about mobile SEO and user experience, and those are tags on my website, I can now say that the keywords of this article are these specific defined terms which exist in this defined term set. I'm now describing the relationships between my content and the ways that I've organized it in a way that Google and other providers and consumers can explicitly understand. I think that's 
from a data architecture perspective, a really big deal. And it's, it's not sexy, it's not exciting, but it's one of those kind of behind the scenes thing that Schema does really well, which is describing those connections so that things which are consuming these stuff these things can really build and understand those relationships. All I right, I have, a, I have a I have a question. I gotta I gotta like <laughs> in our brains of which which data architecture of my brain am I putting this in? Are we putting defined terms in the like really cool variable we can define like property value, or are we putting it in a a, a bucket of um, sort of defined terms around um, kind of relationships and and sort of defining a, a group of things? Uh, so this is interesting, right? It's what is the defined term set? Is it a glossary of all it? the things? Or is it a reference to external stuff? Is it just a pool of things? Um, I don't know yet. Um, I think if you have a glossary on your site, for example, it's a really easy use case to say, let's reference this glossary. If you don't, if you have categories and you have tags and you have archives of things, um, it's a little more vague. This is something that I'm looking at at Yoast. How do we do this in an yeah. intelligent way in the background? Um, and it's almost like a defined sort of group of things, right? Yeah. So it's sort of almost like a collection, you know, like an item list, but of a defined thing that you're wanting to define. And then my other question, go with me on this. Hmm. I'm going to go to Bert <laughs> and pass ah, the right? Right. So, so anytime I see things where schema.org is being used around sort of defining data architecture and organization, and um, I, I think about sort of all the conversation that we've been having around, you know, Bert using the natural language processing to understand concepts, but then also, you know, the, the newest conversation around like looking at passages, so elements of a text yes. in order to kind of think of it, which is which is all data architecture, right? So it's like, how do we architect our content differently with H1s and H2s. Do you see this playing a role there? Yeah, absolutely. And it'll be interesting to see how that compares to the about property, which is already a thing which people use. Which I love, yeah. The mentions property, which is similar. And that I think this hopefully will become the proper way that you do that. I've just seen a really excellent question come in from um, YouTube saying, um, is defined terms similar to the definition tag in HTML5? Yes, yes, absolutely. Except we can also say and here is the URL where this definition lives. And here is the reference to the set of things that this definition is part of. It's definition HTML5. It's like the reference to the grouping almost, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really big deal. Um, why this came up in the first place is I saw an interesting conversation and I can't for the life of me find where it is, um, somewhere on the github.org schema between a bunch of Googlers talking about e-commerce products and defining constrained areas of variables colors, sizes, materials, the kinds of things which many, many e-commerce stores and verticals share. And now these are all defined terms, right? If you're selling a t-shirt in five different colors, red is a defined term. Yellow is a defined term. They are both in a colors defined term set. I think this will weave its way into the e-commerce space very quickly. Interesting stuff. Um, so we've both mentioned Dan Brickley and seen a couple of other faces. I think this is something that we don't do enough um, when we talk about yeah, schema. Yeah, let's call them out. Let's call them out. So schema is not an anonymous thing. It is managed and run and evolved by people. So it's ostensibly open source. There are a bunch of people involved in conversations, ourselves included, but there are really two people at the heart of a lot of what happens. And if you want to understand where schema is going and what's going on, you would struggle to do better than to engage with, read and listen to what these two people are saying. This is Dan Brickley, who works for Google and essentially owns Google's involvement in schema.org. He is right at the forefront of what is this? What is it for? What are we doing? Where should we spend our time? Wonderful guy, though he's not accepting my LinkedIn invitation, so maybe not that wonderful. Um, but really <laughs> at the very forefront. Check him out on Twitter as well. You can Google him really easily. Um, really interesting stuff. The other chap is Richard Wallace, who is um, a phenomenal person. Um, he's an independent consultant on all things structured data, no schema, inside out, back to front, upside down, and works on Google's behalf to essentially be the webmaster of schema.org, which he can't then help but also be heavily involved in schema.org, the standard, because it's essentially the same thing as the website, and really has a, a really fascinating vision on where schema is going and what it could become. There are very, very few conversations that happen at schema.org that these two aren't heavily involved in. So it's worth keeping an eye on what's going on with that. Yeah, really and, nice and, jobs. and Richard's background is in library and sciences, which is like the whole, yeah. you know, where semantic technology came from. So just like my co-founder, Mark, the two of them like to geek out on like all the ontology design and, and so forth. So, you know, him being <laughs> him being part of that, you know, and bringing that semantic technology background, like he's thinking about how he also, you know, how schema you know, really helps build graphs, but different conversation. Back to you. 
Well, interestingly, on different conversations, one of the most interesting things I've chatted with Will Richard Richard about is the idea that um, from an SEO perspective, very few sites implementing schema link outwards. No, nope. it's very very rare for people to say, "Here is my product page and my information, and this mentions." this third party website or third party unless you work with us and then we do it all the time because we believe we should use definitions right yeah part of it and and part of go ahead no no you go go well is it like part of it is like and and actually when you're doing that defined terms all my brain goes to is like wikipedia wikidata like google's knowledge graph like you actually have all these defined terms available anywhere on the web organizations right like if you're talking about a different organization then you can link and say like that organization is defined on their website because of course they should define their own organization so to me it's fundamental to you know connect your own pieces together and what those relationships are and then also things on the web and yeah it's just awesome Precisely. I think there's an inbuilt fear in the SEO world of linking out. And I think that's crept over into building schema connections outwards. But you you only stand to benefit from saying, here's all the information about my thing. And here is the relationships to those things and those things and those things. Be part of this web, for sure. Very nice. Um, so we've also mentioned that um, a lot of the more interesting and um, faster moving components of what's happening in schema.org tend to involve stroke be sponsored by stroke be demanded by Google and people from Google. Um, it's really interesting if you go and search the schema.org repo, I'm sure we've mentioned this for Google, you can very quickly get an idea for where different parts of Google are pushing for standards, things like these. So these three are from, I think, as recently as August. I think two of these are now in the main schema.org standard and one of them is pushing through pending. So you can get a feel for um, just how um, streamlined this is. And as we've touched on, a lot of these are either in directly e-commerce spaces or verticals where Google are pushing to roll out or enhance their own products and properties and search experiences. So if even if you're not that interested in schema, though, I can't imagine that's the case. Um, going and looking at this can give you a real insight into what's their strategic direction, what's on the roadmap, where should I be looking next? This is huge. And it's coming from multiple areas of Google now. So yeah. that's, I, I think, the part that, you know, for for those lovers of schema, we're, we're finally, like, seeing multiple different groups kind of, you know, advocate for changes. And, and so we are seeing it sort of be comprehensively used across Google. <coughs> Absolutely. And only faster. So this one was relatively new. I thought this was eight days ago. This is really interesting. This is Dan Brickley on behalf of Google, but saying the teams at Google who are doing something are finding it painful to relate a menu with a food service. Okay, so there's a technical challenge with the structure of schema.org and the things and the relationships, which makes it bizarrely difficult to say this restaurant has this menu. So fix that. But I think what's interesting here is the subtext is there is a team at Google who are working on connecting the relationships between restaurants and menus. That says to me, watch for the search results in this space. If you are involved in the food and restaurant space, get on top of describing all your menus. There is schema for this. Most restaurant menus live buried in ancient out of date PDF files. If you can get first mover advantage to take advantage of what's going on here, this is your strategic roadmap. Great stuff. Um, yeah, no, I should, oops. no, sorry, sorry, I'll let you carry on. We'll pick up on it afterwards, it's fine, carry on. Oh, okay, that's exciting. Secret conversations. Um, the flip side of this is there's a lot of very so this is this is pretty shallow and pretty quick. Like, yeah, that's interesting. The other side is there are some really terrifyingly deep and verbose conversations, um, which I think it's worth picking on this one because um, it talks a little to how schema.org works and how some of us might want to get involved in it. So schema.org is an open source standard to a degree. You can have an opinion, you can contribute, you can suggest things to be added to it. This particular thread, and I won't link you to it because nobody needs to read all the way through it, um, is hundreds of posts in an argument between a half a dozen people, myself included, Dan Brickley, Richard Wallace, about whether schema.org ought to have a concept for homepage, which Bizarrely is something it lacks. So you can say this is an FAQ page, this is a web page, this is a contact page. You can't say this is a home page. And there's some really compelling arguments in each direction as to whether we should do this. Um, what I want to flag is that Dan closed that conversation because um, the way that pending.schema.org works and the way that we get things into these discussions and conversations is there has to be a use case already in place. So whilst there are huge gaps and opportunities here for going and playing with things like food service, it's not worth going crazy and just exploring stuff that will never be adopted. Really, we are shackled to um, a large scale schema.org consumer driving the agenda. And incidentally, 
there is only one large scale schema to all consumer, <laughs> and that's Google. So if you really, really want to get a grip, grip of exactly where schema.org is going and what's going coming next, all you have to do is search through these Google tickets because that's more or less the only thing that's going to be coming next. Ouch. Yeah, the, the conversations can be long, so make sure to have a big cup of coffee or something oh, stronger if you want to read through it. <laughs> Um, a few other interesting bits. I just want to flag that we won't go into a detail that are just worth signposting. So there is a ton of stuff in pending coming around different types of payments. We've mentioned briefly, but you really get a feel for how varied that is. Looking at things like um, mortgage repayment rates and early prepayment penalties. We know from, um, well, we suspect that based on this, Google are getting into the, the housing space. We know there was a big schema release recently that added things like um, floor plans and number of rooms. And is this for rental or purchase? But there's some really interesting other bits in there like describing cashback processes and loan information definitely be looking into some of this um and then related um on the um firstly on the payment schedules and subscriptions being able to say you pay by day by month this happens daily this happens six times this happens every tuesday but only eight times there are a lot of real world scenarios where people's pricing models work like that. Things like mobile phone contracts, broadband we've mentioned. If you have complex pricing structures, it's really hard to describe those at the moment. But again, the first mover advantage for you getting there, describing your prices in a way that uses this and getting into the search results will be huge. Um, there's some interesting in the second box, some interesting new content type descriptions. So at the moment, we really have web page, article, different types of article, web page content, which is a bit vague. Now we have these more specific types of news articles. So not just news article, but this is a analysis news article. This is a background news article. And there are some particularly interesting ones in here like review news article, which in schema.org functions both as a review and an article which at the moment, if you wanted to hybridize those, it's a bit technical and a bit faffy. Now we're starting to get much more specific targeted types of content. This is Google driving an agenda to want to understand what is this thing. Um, and then in relation to that, I don't know how many of you have come across this, but um, oh, what's it called? The, the Trust Project, um, uh, 2014, 2015, maybe. Um, the I put it in my notes. Is it the Trust Project? What is it? I yeah, don't know. Project .org. Yeah, so this was set up by um, a bunch of independent people, but Google plowed millions of funding into it. The idea is the Trust Project is the organization and the, the collaborative idea that we fix fake news. And we do that through investing in people and processing technology and open standards. Google plowed a huge amount of money into it um, and time and people. One of the things that it identified was that in order for publishers and newspapers to be trustworthy, they really ought to have things like diversity policies and disclosure of where their funding comes from and information on who their senior editors are. That kind of makes sense from a human perspective. The, a site is less likely to be publishing fake news if there is a detailed page describing here is the background of the editor, here is the process by which we make decisions on what we do and don't feature, etc, etc. There are schema properties for these things. You can say, here is my corrections policy. Here is my feedback policy. Here is the page which describes our editorial mission. Here are the kinds of topics we do and don't cover. If you're a publisher, I think this is a huge deal. When you look at the amount of energy that um, Google and others are putting into the Trust Project, when you see the amount of news around fake news, a big part of what Google want to use schema.org for when it comes to publishers is verification, is authority, is trust, is validating that this news article we can put at the top of the search results because we know that it's right, we know that it's safe, and we know that it's accurate. This is going to play a huge part in it, I think. It's worth looking into that. Um, this is much more nerdy, but one of the... Oh, I love this part. Do yeah, it, I really it. want this to, to, to really get out of pending. Um, one of the big objections you tend to get from developer-type people when you're implementing extensive schema is that's a lot of code to put on the page. It's going to slow us down. That's kilobytes and kilobytes of data. Now... They may be right or wrong. There are technically ways you can manage that. Things like gzipping pages means that duplication isn't really an issue. Duplicating text in schema and on the page isn't an SEO issue, so it's not the end of the world. But you do end up outputting 20, 30 kilobytes of stuff on the page at the top of the page quite often, which can have a performance impact no matter how much work you do on it. So there is a big issue that if I want to describe an FAQ or an article really verbosely in my schema. I have to put all of the content from that thing in my schema and it's already on the page, that sucks. One possible solution for that 
is using CSS selectors or XPath selectors to say instead, um, the content of my article is in that block or in that div or has this CSS selector, which means I can just point Google or the browser at it. I don't have to repeat it. I can just reference where it lives on the page. There's only limited support for this at the moment. It only works in speakable schema, which I'm half convinced that Google are going to deprecate. Yeah, I feel really the same powerful. way. Yeah, I yeah, feel the same thing speakable, right? Like it's just like about how sort of elements of the page and, you know, XPath, I always like to explain it for those that are not so technical that it's like almost like geo coordinates of a page, right? Nice. So you can be you can be really specific um, as to sort of what that element is. And yeah, like the third line of the second paragraph after the fifth image. Yeah. Um, nice. And but I, I think, you know, your speakable comment is is really interesting. But it's, yeah, it's, you know, we'll see. I, I think the other piece with Schema.org is they're trying to make it so it isn't so complicated that only, you know, like they have to call Schema app to do it for you, you know, good or bad news <laughs> for me. But like, you know, some of these some of these more advanced pieces, like make it so like your technical team does have to be involved or you call us, right? Like it's it's sort of like one of those pieces. So I, we'll, we'll see sort of where, where they play with this. Um, you know, it's also interesting as they do more natural language processing, you know, what are they gaining or, or sort of what entities are they pulling out and, and sort of how does that play? Um, although I do agree with you on the speakable, I think FAQ and some of the other ways that we're structuring data is helping them answer those questions. Yeah, and I get slightly nervous about that because it's, if, if Google, hmm. To, if Google no longer needs us to use CSS selector type to mark up scheme speakable, if they no longer need us to say this is the content of this article because they're smart enough to look at the page and work out which the article bit is, that is great. That's great for Google. It's great for us not needing developers and tools to do this. However, there are other technologies and platforms and people who would benefit from schema describing that explicitly. Not every, everybody has Google's processing power. And it feels like that accidentally plays towards Google's advantages in a way that doesn't help the open web. So pros and cons. Um, oh yeah, I, I should have moved to that slide. That would have been really helpful, wouldn't it? Um, details on CSS select slide. Um, this speaks back to the, the defined term set stuff in the e-commerce. I this this is the beginning of Google trying to codify all of e-commerce. Like if you have a t-shirt in 10 colors, you can't, uh, th those colors are defined things. They, red is a thing. Your red is the same as um, Amazon's red. Your red is the same as Argus's red. This is the same concept. Um, large should mean the same across all, I was about to say large should mean the same across all clubs. It really shouldn't. But um, you get the idea that there are, only a certain number of moving parts and types of variables in the e-commerce space in particular. And if Google can define those and standardize those, they can start to do things like their own product comparison much more effectively. And um, there is so much going on in this in trying to define and lock down moving parts and products um, well worth looking into. There is a huge problem um, with e-commerce schema at the moment that it's um, there is no good way, and we've talked about this, no good way to describe product variants if I have a t-shirt in three sizes and five colors, it's really, really hard to usefully and accurately describe every single one of those variants. There is no concept of this is the parent t-shirt and here are its variants. That's what this is introducing. This idea of product groups and product variants is a big deal. I now have the canonical definitive t-shirt and then this one varies by color, this one varies by size, this one varies by shipping information, etc. That as it starts to get used and comes out, will have a huge impact on um, all product, all scheme of products that have variant types. It's going to be um, transformative, well worth looking into. And then I think this is last because that's a lot to take in and get through, but it really is worth just going and skimming through this. There's so much you can pick up on and what's going on. Again, there is so much happening here. You can see with complex pricing options, return information. This is newish. Um, I can say, here is my website's um, product return policy. Um, or here is this product specific product return policy and you can differentiate between those, which is quite interesting. And um, again, this speaks to trust. Um, if Google is looking to make sure, if not reward, at least make sure that all of these um, options it's providing right in the search results with all of these data points and prices and delivery information exposed, they're absolutely going to want to make sure that um, you're just doing a good job of describing all of the things that demonstrate that you're trustworthy, like having a reasonable and well described return policy. Yeah, this is five minutes of me screenshotting one fifth of the pending list. It is well worth going and looking through that 
just to get an idea of what's coming. Because if it's got as far as pending, chances are Google have seen it and been involved in the conversation at some point, or some conversation of Dan Brickley and Richard Wallace have, in which case it's almost certain to get through as well. I don't think I've seen many examples yet where stuff falls out of pending. It maybe sits there forever, but worth looking at. I may have one or two examples. Nice. I think the other key thing is is you can try using pending, right? Yep. So we've actually seen opportunities where like it's in pending, but Google fully supports it, and you can see it in in the tools. So again, you know, just like you know, look beyond the required and recommended properties to fully describe what you do. Period, right? Whether it be a product, yep. you're talking about colors of t-shirts, products of weight, height, you know, width, you know, G-tins, like you name it. Um, you know, like look at that whole vocabulary to fully explain explicitly what it is. Yeah, especially when we know there's a lag between Google launching new features and describing them and updating documentation and even just the all that stuff, right? Knowing it. Yeah, if it's impending, it being impending is not a reason not to use it. If you're already doing the kind of content and data audits that you should be doing and building stuff, then yeah, test to measure. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's absolutely great. I mean, like all the information you shared, I mean, it's absolutely superb. Um, one thing I was going to pick up on was the food service. Um, Google My Business wants restaurants to put their menus within there. So is is this a way that they can easily pick that up and read it if you're calling it out? Um, that's that's all I was going to pick up on what you're talking about, John. Hopefully yeah. it's the same yeah. stuff that you, sorry, go. Same yeah, same yeah. stuff. Like menu's been always kind of a pain in the butt for restaurants. Like it's um, yeah. there's a restaurant we work with like since 2014 and like they've always had a, a trouble. They're just like to cl make clear delineation and then how is it going to be used? And I think now that we're seeing, I'll say um, more e-commerce of food, right? And food delivery. Like I think that will evolve yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely um, taken off in in this period that we've been in food delivery. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we've got some questions from the audience. Um, if if we we'll try and get to as many as we can, uh, Mark has got one. Uh, what updates and changes in schema do you think are particularly related to tech-related websites and or e-commerce? So um, yeah, there it is. There. So obviously, I know you touched on some of the newer stuff coming. Um, is there anything in specific you guys have got uh, related to uh, a tech-related website that's obviously e-commerce based? <laughs> yeah, so if you, I, I always think of two things, right? So, um, and they're principles that apply to everyone. So one is like, if you think of your schema markup strategy, think of like the content you need found. And so in a tech-related site, that might be like your solutions, it might be your products, it might be um, your case studies, right? So they might be like a little less like direct e-commerce. And the example I often use is like my schema app highlighter page, which is like our primary enterprise product. I'm not going to put a price in there and I'm not going to have a rating on it because <laughs> it's like, it's just not appropriate. And so when you understand what those top content pieces are, then sort of see like, are they eligible for a rich result based on the content that I have on there? So one action you can do is like to actually add content to the site to allow you to be eligible for those. Or you can do some beautiful nesting um, where for example the example I often use is for our highlighter I have FAQ on the page because I'm never going to put the exact price and the rating on that page but I you know an FAQ makes sense like people are wondering you know like does it work on all websites like does it work with everything in schema.org yes 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 it does so like I can put that in the FAQ so you can use nesting as a way to sort of you know have some of that kind of broader content on a tech website that perhaps is is not sort of I'll say black and white tied to a rich result um, and then you can kind of feel like you know how do you how do you leverage the rich results in, in different ways so that would be my recommendation and then that I would say like the e-com stuff that's just exciting that's coming down are some of the ones we mentioned so you know they'd be able to delineate price type delineate types of things you're selling so again I'll use schema app as examples like we do like a setup and strategy cost we have like a subscription element you know we have high touch support like so being able to delineate between those different offerings which I think speaks to sort of more of the complexity which you know as a tech website or a tech company um, you know that that that's going to play an important role that's it and then um, John Francos, I'm not going to pronounce your surname because I'm going to get it wrong. <laughs> um, so this one here is uh, every vegan uh, and every vegan recipe. So two people asking the same question. Since new Google tool is rich results test, um, what kind of tool can we use to test Jason LD? This tool is not covering every case. And, and I know I helped someone out with this the other day. They were trying to test their service scheme and they couldn't see it within this tool because obviously it's the rich results test. It's not a structured data test. 
So is, is there any tools that you guys know of? Jono, oh, do you want to, why don't you start? And then I actually have an image of a, a comparison between the tools that I can share. Oh, nice. Um, so I swear by classyschema.org. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, it does a level of debugging that very few of the other tools do. And it also does a really nice visualization of your schema graph. So you can see where are things connected? Where are the relationships? Um, where am I missing relationships? Where are the errors? Um, absolutely fantastic. Awesome. Um, there's a ton. It depends on like what you're trying to test would be some of what, what I'll share is in, in sort of like what, again, you're trying to kind of call it. So this is a an article that Jasmine on my team wrote, say goodbye to Google structured data testing tool, hello alternatives. And we sort of kind of talk about the comparison of a lot of them. Um, and, and so the rich result test, we like it because it's being kept up to date. It will also look at different types of rich results. So if you're doing sort of advanced um, schema markup that has like how to and FAQ and perhaps product all on one page, it'll look at that, um, you know, but then there's also like um, nothing like the SD linter, which is like open source validates schema. So it's a question of like do you want to validate you know all the different types and all the different properties and so forth to make sure that you have valid schema markup versus are you testing for rich results and are you trying to do it on a page by page basis or are you trying to do it across the board so it really depends um like right sd helper is, is a new chrome extension that came out that that looks pretty good it's really easy to use um schema.dev you know has a really familiar interface kind of looks and feels a lot like the old one and structured data testing tools still around right so um i I still use it to kind of look at what all the structured data there is and what their relationships are. So um, this is a handy article if you want to read more sort of, again, Jasmine on our team, who's both a customer success manager and a, has a semantic background sort of went through. Yeah. And I, I will get this shameless plug in. I've got my developers working on one. Once they're finished, me throwing loads of other stuff at them. Um, and, and that is going to be available on an API as well. So, yeah, so it just depends on the use case, right? I think that's like the big piece of like, where are you trying to get it? Um, you know, rich result test is indeed where Google's pointing you to do to look at validation for rich results. So again, yeah. if you're trying to do rich result testing, that's a great space. If you're trying to do it site-wide, you can um, reach out to us or um, there's also other other crawlers and so forth that do a good job there. That's it. And then obviously every vegan recipe you're saying, is there any changes within recipe schema? Um, I've not seen any. Have you guys seen any? No, there wasn't a whole lot. I actually went to Google Changes, John, already to have a look to see if there's anything. And there hasn't been a whole lot. Like there's some do some documentation and support changes for recipe um, in Google Search Console, but that was way back in June. Um, what I like about recipes is they're saying like they often use it to introduce new things. I wouldn't agree with that. I, I think we're seeing more of them sort of prioritize where we're seeing, I'll say like the consumer have needs. Um, one of the things that they up updated using recipe as an example which we do often see. Um, one of my my favorite updates is around like them and their the documentation saying, you know, you should nest things such as <laughs> a recipe and video and use add ID because then we know the video is about the recipe and therefore you can show the recipe or you can oh, show the video. Yes. Um, one of my favorite updates because it like validates everything I've been saying since 2015. So, um, but I would say they're using it as a lot of examples, but I'm not seeing them use that as a, a primary first, um, maybe back in the day, but I would say like we're seeing the most of the changes in e-com these days. Yeah, and that answers the next question as well, which is Andy, which is um, obviously why does Google introduce most of the new stuff changes with recipes? So yeah, there it is there. Uh, they seem to love recipes and introduce something new. So. I think that's what you've just touched on there is the fact that they're always using that as an example because you can mess so much stuff within there. Yeah, it's such a deep format, right? When you really start going and it has a video and it's inherently a how-to guide, therefore it has steps and all sorts. I did notice that um, it is, I think it is the most complex example Google have in their documentation. And it feels like it's breaking at the seams a bit because they have this concept of guided recipes which yeah. is if you've got enough steps and images and videos in the right format, it becomes eligible to be read out on Google Assistant and to help you through the steps. But then as you're reading through the documentation, it's like big red markers saying, oh, this bit's different in Assistant and this bit only works here. And it feels like their approach to this is a little bit clunky. So maybe some changes to refine that in the works, at least hopefully, because if all of their documentation goes down this route, it's going to become an absolute minefield. That's it. And then our, our friend, John, Jean Francois, I know you pronounce it much better. Jean than that's, that's it. it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Would like to know your thoughts on item condition property, the second-hand product market for e-commerce. Uh, checking the Google Quiz, I can't see anything related to this. I know within a product feed, there's item condition. So, um, 
have you guys seen it in the in the schema world yeah, so we like if that content is on the page and is relevant. So if you're a secondhand product seller, you know, use item condition. Just like if you have colors of T-shirts or weight of product, and that's really relevant uh, to your consumer, you know, use the schema.org vocabulary to to define that. So um, it is included. I was checking this um, earlier. It is included in their example schema um, JSON LD on the page of the documentation. Um, it is something again like we often use. What's interesting is sometimes times um, in, I'll say like the plugins for um, different things, they don't necessarily use all the vocabulary for the different item types. So it's just one of those things to make sure that um, if you're automating your schema for e-commerce that it's representing it, sometimes people just default it to new or default it to available, which is less good, especially if your data feed um, is, is saying otherwise. That's it, that's perfect. And I think that's the end. If anyone's watching has got any more questions, that would be great. Uh, yeah, classy schema. I know that one well. Um, that's a very good tool, that one. Um, so, yeah, so one one of the interesting types of pending scheme that I've seen was one which is Math Solver, um, which, is, which is a bit of a random one. It says that it's to do with websites that have got mathematical equations. Um, have you guys come across any any strange structured data types that are really sort of like outside of the box like that one for example oh that's a good question that's you should have given us that one beforehand <laughs> though, like yeah. our, our super <laughs> favorite <laughs> schema types you know on those proper <laughs> random ones that are that are really out there that yeah i mean obviously there's there's justification behind having it there obviously um but yeah it was it was just one that i see within the pending that i was like okay um, I did. I caught recently in one of the updates they made ski resort a subclass of resort, which feels yeah. like an insane amount of specificity. Like there are there are real problems that schema.org needs to solve, and granular classification of different type of holiday resorts doesn't feel like it should be high on that list. Yeah, that was in the so, schema version ten release. Like there wasn't yeah. a whole lot of excitement in that release. <laughs> and, and, and like we actually highlighted, you know, as a skier, like I was like, yeah. I want know if it's a ski resort not a beach resort that's great <laughs> um you know it, it, it's just like one of those kind of crazy things i think um th i've been spending a lot of time in health schema markup and i i think one of the things that um a lot of companies don't know is like how detailed that extension is and and sort of you know how how you know everything so if you're in um products and you do diet work you know you can talk about you know different types of treatments so if you're you know a service provider and a naturopathy and you have different treatments so i like it's one that i feel like is um you know, less known because it's not necessarily, again, where you're like, oh, all the rich results for, you know, this medical condition, right? We're going to have, you know, but but there's like so much that you can do in there. And then it relays back to like a lot of the medical pieces. So I guess those are some of mine with just regards to like how defined it is. Um, same for like automotive, right? So these are some of the extensions that some of them have been pulled in like FIBO for finance. Um, finance is also like an interesting one, although there's like a bit of gap sometimes in insurance in defining sort of all like the different insurance pieces. Um, and then actually to go back um, to, uh, I believe it was Jean-Francois or Mark, um, Mark's question around um, technology companies, one of the ones that's like harder to define within schema.org is, is a bug. And, um, you know, like what is, um, like how do you define a bug in software, right? And, and so in a lot of um, technical companies, so I grew up at Cisco, so I used to actually own bug toolkit for Cisco globally um, as one of my products. You know, how do you define the bug? Like it's a, it's, a, it's, te it's a technical article, right, with regards to it, but it's actually like defining a defect. And, and I think it's, it's one that is a gap today. Um, I haven't seen anything come out that sort of helps resolve that. But um, for all us software companies out there who, who want to sort of be transparent and build trust uh, by being articulate, um, I, I feel like that one's a gap. I have two yeah, favorites no, no. that I've just, oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I have two favorites I've just plucked out of thin air having skimmed through and found some previous ones. <laughs> I really like Hyper TOC, which is new. So a hyper table of contents, which is a table of contents, but for a rich complex media object that navigates between images and bits of videos and multiple videos stitched together. I really like the idea of that. But that got me onto one that I, um, I've i been looking at quite a bit recently, which isn't a schema um, type, but a property. 
Um, I think there's loads more stuff we can be doing with accessibility feature, mm, which can be, um, a property of pretty much anything. So anything you describe in, in Schema, you can also describe what accessibility features it has, i.e. this uses alternative text. This can be controlled by a keyboard. This has flashing images, so watch out. This um, has a tab order. You can describe all of those issues, risks, and capabilities in a way that could be quite useful for screen readers and assistive technologies. I don't know how well utilized they are yet, but they won't be until we mark them up. So if you want to um, push forward on the cutting edge of accessibility tech, then that might be worth looking into. Yeah, and that's, that's going to be big in the States because that's a big drive out there now in the States is the yep. accessibility of websites. I think um, everywhere. Canada just has like, you know, it's been actually a couple of years now, three or four years that, that they've been pushing as well to have, you know, I'll say newer, higher um, expectations um, with regards to accessibility. Okay, and, and, and I, I'm going to build on that though, because like, oh. I also love, okay, it's Martha, future strategist kind of coming in, but like <laughs> the whole accessibility piece though, is that like what can, has access, understands the accessibility of your website, but also like the structured data is this common machine vocabulary, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, you could often say that like by having structured data, you're allowing <laughs> different machines to understand, you know, just like the White House recommended everyone use special announcement to get COVID information out there, I'm going to pitch schema markup to be like the next big thing for accessibility because it does actually allow, again, schema.org being this common vocabulary, you know, more people to understand. And, um, you know, th this is where I think, you know, what we talked about today is being this community and collaboration and where Google is still driving a lot of it. You know, I... I see chatbots using this. Like on-site search has been using structured content for years, mm -hmm. you know, trying to make sure they understand and kind of s provide service right through um, the different elements. So, uh, you know, I'm excited because I, you know, who's going to be the first chatbot to start pulling my schema markup? And if you want to do that, call me because I'm I'm sort of all in to sort of help um, those knowledge drafts be accessible to to, to promote understanding. Schema as an accessibility eye. We've been thinking a lot about how we use Ooh, yeah. schema as an API. That's really awesome. There we are. Playing, um, <laughs> what does the schema version of this URL look like? So for any given URL on a website, being able to say, I don't want the colors and the CSS and the content and the HTML. I just want the data representation of this URL, whether it's yeah. a page or not. As the data layer. Yeah, which yeah, is really which is cool. again like I'll say like our bigger goal at Schema App, right? Like we're we're a knowledge graph company that does yeah. schema markup. <laughs> um, nice. Yes, That's if you it. want to talk about that, call me. I love that. <laughs> I love those conversations. That's it. And this just goes back to what obviously John Mueller said earlier on in the year, which is that scheme is going to get a lot more technical and it's going to get a lot more tougher. Yep. You know, and and then and bringing in elements like we're seeing now, you can start to understand how it's not just as easy to just deploy things automatically. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah certain amount of stuff can be. Do you know what I mean? And and that's fine. But then when you want to get really granular, um, you got you got to really sort of like get get deep down and in the nitty gritty of the code to sort of like push those changes forward. Or be yeah. a really good philosopher to ask, what is this thing I'm talking about, and how do I best describe it? Right. I, I joke that philosophers are some of the best people at schema markup because they know how to to ask that thing. That's it. Yeah. Well, we haven't got no more questions. We're at the top of the hour. Maybe so, people can throw in ideas for the next webinar, what they want us to talk about. Yeah, that'd about. be super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If anyone watching has got any ideas of what they'd like us to cover, whether that would be structured data for new sites or um, whatever else it could be, then, yeah, just just put it in the chat or reach out to one of us, and then we can, Martha, we can get that set up. Sorry, Martha, you suggested um, how what how schema has changed as consumer behavior has changed given COVID and vice versa. I know. That I might be a really fun one. one. Yeah, it might be really fun because we can then actually pull in data um, on on sort of what that consumer behavior has changed. And I, I think it's going to be interesting. Um, in Canada, we're sort of in the middle of that second wave. And so I, I feel like there's more change coming um, as we yeah. sort of see new behaviors and, um, you know, as as families and, and everyone goes through a different lockdown, the holidays are going to be different. Um, you know, let's see what comes out sort of in the next 30 to 60 days. We often see a release of schema markup in beginning of January, like in mm. those first three weeks, maybe we won't see that based on the fact that we just got one. Um, but I, I think that might be might be a fun one. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they bring anything out like regarding like restaurants and like other locations being like COVID secure or COVID safe, depending on what language or verbiage they're using in your part of the world. 
Um, so. Yeah, we, were, we work with a lot of hospitals. So we've been sort of working with them on sort of ways they can use schema to, to build trust like through search, right? So that's um, yeah. something that we've been we've been working a lot on. Yeah, medical, I've done a lot with, with the medical codes and, and that's, that's deep. Right. <laughs> but anyway, right. we're at the top of the hour. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, it's been absolutely great. And thank you, Martha and Jono, for sharing your insights and, and seeing the structured data world from your eyes. Um, it's been absolutely super. And thank you for the people at SEMrush for putting this on. And um, we'll see you all next time. Thanks, everyone. Good work. Bye.